zero. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear delegates of Horace's Global Meeting, uh, dear speakers, uh, dear Dr. Frank Richter, chairman of Horace's, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Richter for, the great, for this great opportunity uh, to discuss uh, and highlight the Greater Caspian region. Uh, Greater Caspian region is the big region. Uh, all countries uh, surrounding Caspian Sea, Black Sea, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and even northern Pakistan. Uh, it's uh, 500 million people, uh, 10 million square kilometers, a $3 trillion GDP. And uh, the most important uh, is that this is uh, one of the future potential points of growth for the world economy. And uh, we have excellent people in the region, very well educated, uh, very professional, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, internal problems and issues uh, which we are going to discuss. And, uh, and what, we could, what could be done, what, uh, what people could do to help the situation. And I will introduce uh, briefly our speakers. Uh, we, are plan we are planning to have today five speakers. Uh, first will be uh, Ambassador Matthew Breiser, uh, who was uh, before the Ambassador of the United States to Azerbaijan and former Deputy Assistant of Secretary of State of the United States. Also, he was working with the, uh, for the National Security Council uh, and he was responsible exactly for the energy policy of the Greater Caspian region. Uh, then uh, we will have Claude Bigle, Dr. Claude Bigle. Uh, he's a Swiss politician and uh, high-level business manager. Uh, he was a member of the parliament, Swiss national parliament. Also, he was the chairman of the Swiss Post, and everybody knows him in Switzerland, like I told. Uh, we have Abdullah Hanjani, our friend from Afghanistan. Uh, he's the senior deputy minister uh, of Afghanistan in the Ministry for Peace. And uh, I think uh, peace uh, is the most important uh, thing uh, for Afghanistan, for Afghanistan people, for Afghan people. That's why we would like to hear his opinion on these uh, issues. Also, we will have uh, Babar Badat. He just joined. I see him, but I don't see the video yet. Uh, and uh, Babar Badat is the great expert in logistics and uh, transportation. Uh, he was uh, the president of FIAT, which is the International Federation of Freight Forwarders Association. It's uh, more than 40,000 companies united under, this, uh, as, uh, under FIAT and uh, in more than 150 countries. This is really a global organization. Oh, perfect. We see now uh, Mr. Badat. Yes, welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have uh, also today Filippo Lombardi. Uh, now he is the vice president of OSCC Silk Road Support Group. He is a former speaker of Parliament of Switzerland. Uh, and uh, with uh, five brilliant speakers uh, who could share their opinions on various topics, how to develop uh, the Greater Caspian region. I would like uh, to give the floor first uh, to Ambassador Breiser uh, because he's the uh, really expert in the energy policy and he was uh, staying at the beginning of the initiation of practically all supergiant energy projects in the region. Uh, please, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Seitnapieslov. Thank you for the honor of being here with you. And it's nice to have our Caspian Week reunion <laughs> in part. And of course, thanks to Frank as well, Frank Richter, for, for giving us a chance to get together. Um, yeah, so the United States has never really conceived of a greater Caspian region and should have a long time ago. Uh, because all of these countries we're going to talk about are, are really are interconnected already, whether we like it or not. <laughs> and there's so much more, as Murat just said, that, that the global economy and the regional economies could get out of these relationships if, if we thought in a more uh, sort of connected way, which is the point of this session. So we in the United States, we sort of at least fell into the idea that uh, Central Asia, at least the, the post-Soviet five Central Asian states and Europe, uh, should be connected for economic reasons. This was for the, the uh, export of oil and gas. Uh, from It ended up being just from Azerbaijan, more or less so far, well, and Kazakhstan, because Turkmenistan had 
not yet decided it wanted to pursue a Trans-Caspian natural gas pipeline. I'll come to that in a second. That may be changing. So the United States supported the countries of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey to develop the Baku Tbilisi Jehan natural gas uh, oil pipeline and the South Caucasus natural gas pipeline. That began in the late 1990s. Both projects are hugely successful. There was a, a point where for, for BP, um, the combination of the upstream investment offshore Azerbaijan and the Baku Tbilisi Jayan pipeline was the most, the, one of the two most valuable producing assets in the entire world for peace. So these were good investments, both in terms of strategic, political, and security interests, but most importantly, for, for commercial reasons, you know, the investors have made a good return. Um, but we still, our vision was limited. We, 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 of course, we had our great work on Afghanistan, but it hadn't ever been really integrated in the thinking with the five Central Asian states in the Soviet Union, and certainly not with our, our strategic thinking with regard to Europe. Um, that all changed on September 11th, 2001, uh, with the attacks on Washington and New York. And, you know, the next day, the president of Azerbaijan, Haidar Aliyev, contacted the U.S. Embassy and said, we know you want to move into Afghanistan. I'm so sorry, Mr. Minister, but we know you're going to want to do it. Uh, we pledge everything to you in terms of our territory, air, land, and sea, and we will be with you till the very end. And, and that has been true. So um, we ended up then, okay, now we were connecting Europe uh, because of the trans routes that led either through the air or by the Black, by Black Sea, but over Europe, uh, across the South Caucasus, across the Caspian Sea, Central Asia, uh, and into Afghanistan. Uh, but still, we hadn't really systematically thought about how, how we integrate all of our policy initiatives. Uh, and, and that largely is because of bureaucracy. I mean, the way the U.S. military and the U.S. State Department are structured is now that um, Europe or the European parts of those entities uh, – move up to the Caspian Sea. So Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, they're all grouped together with, with Europe operationally. But anything on the other side of the Caspian Sea or south of Turkey is, is uh, bureaucratically separated. So now we're seeing new opportunities to pull Central Asia and the South Caucasus and Europe together uh, in a more dynamic way. One way is through uh, telecommunications and uh, a new project called the Digital Silk Road, which yes. is to connect data centers uh, in Bulgaria uh, with Georgia via a cable under the Caspian Sea. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get on again. Oh, about that? Sorry, no. just, just one second. Sorry, please, dear speakers, please switch off your microphones while you are not speaking. Otherwise, it's a bit noisy. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Badat, uh, Dr. Begle, please switch off for now. Then, uh, then you can switch on. Just the microphone. Code. Hello. Yeah, yes. Uh, Claude, can you switch off your microphone while uh, Matthew is speaking? Otherwise, we can... Yes, I try. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, Matthew. Okay. So I was just saying that now there's a whole new realm of interconnectivity that's connecting Europe, the EU space, uh, with Central Asia uh, via the Black Sea, a subsea cable, then across the South Caucasus, uh, under the Caspian Sea, and then into both Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. Uh, this project is called the Digital Silk Road. It's going to hopefully have major data centers in Tbilisi and Baku, where content providers can, like Amazon or Netflix or whomever, uh, can house their content so that the service provided to the consumers in these far-flung regions is much better, m much lower latency. But going back to energy... Um, Something big has happened during this year, and that is that Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan finally reached an agreement on to develop a disputed oil field and gas field in the middle of the Caspian Sea, which they've renamed Dostluk, which means friendship. Um, their dispute over this, this field had obstructed their cooperation on many other things, including a trans-Caspian natural gas pipeline. Now, an Azerbaijani, uh, actually private company, on behalf of the Azerbaijani government, is negotiating with the Turkmenistani government on how to develop that field and the export of some of that those hydrocarbons westward to Azerbaijan, where Azerbaijan really does need more gas to develop its petrochemical sector. So hopefully we're entering a new era on cross-Caspian cooperation, both in the digital space, maybe in the gas pipeline space. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, there's Afghanistan. Afghanistan is at this amazingly crucial, difficult, but promising moment. We all know that a year ago, uh, there was the uh, uh, preliminary agreement signed between the U.S. and the Taliban, which was 
Hard for me to understand from a strategic sense, since it really was just an excuse for the United States to pull out. Um, but now, now, thank goodness, the, the government, as we'll hear about in a moment, uh, and the Taliban are engaged, are going to be engaged in negotiations. And you know, think of what peace in Afghanistan would mean for Afghanistan in the context of the greater Caspian vision that Murat uh, laid out. For the first time in Afghanistan's history, it will have a chance to uh, connect itself uh, in a 360 de degree way down to the south, to the, to the Indian Ocean, and then northwesterly through Turkmenistan to the, and across the Caspian Sea in toward Europe. So the opportunities are huge. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about how the peace uh, talks are going. And, and, and maybe we'll have time to, to, to speak about some potential energy infrastructure projects that have been on the, on the drawing board for, for a decade or more, one in the sphere of natural gas uh, and one in the sphere of electricity, connecting Afghanistan to Pakistan uh, and maybe, maybe India someday. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, very difficult uh, to add something to your really exciting speech. And uh, uh, I know that you are in your soul, you are with our region, the Great Caspian region, and you, you are living in Turkey. And uh, yes, you are really connected to this region. And uh, now I would like uh, to introduce our second speaker, uh, His Ex Excellency uh, Abdullah Hanjani, uh, who is the Senior Deputy Minister for Peace of Afghanistan. And uh, uh, I think it will be very interesting for audience and uh, for the speakers and for me personally uh, to hear from the first hand, to get uh, first hand information. Uh, what was uh, the peacemaking process before? What is the current status today? What are the future perspectives and, and ideas? And uh, more importantly, uh, what will happen after? Which uh, perspectives and horizons will be opened for Afghanistan economy and for, Afghanistan, for Afghan people after the peacemaking process will be uh, successfully finalized? Please. Your... Please, microphone. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Murad. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to reconnect, as Ambassador Matthew mentioned, with old friends. And uh, we're very grateful of you personally, and of course, uh, Dr. Frank, for, having, for providing this opportunity today here to, 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 to make our comments in this critical time of our history that Afghanistan is facing. Let me start from where uh, 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 Ambassador Matthew uh, crossed so smoothly and wisely from that. So that, that's from 2001, September 11. I think it's important to, to reconnect a little bit to the uh, history and give a context of that and then come back what's going on at the moment. Yeah, after the 9-11 uh, attacks uh, in the United States, there was a... Uh, an absolute uh, consensus uh, regionally and internationally that the United States should intervene in Afghanistan. And I think that was that, that created a bigger opportunity on that time in order to integrate the region, not only uh, in the context of war and terror, but mainly uh, to, 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 to redefine the relationship with the countries in the region. After 20 years, we are, we are with it at the moment. I think it, it needs a long debate and a long conversation. But I would, I would, I would touch upon three uh, things here. Firstly, uh, it's the biggest game changer at the moment is that the, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and its relocation in the future. Because if the United States may have bases in Pakistan that would politically interpret it differently by the China and Pakistan relationship. If the United States will have another base, some bases in, in Central Asia, for example, in Uzbekistan, then there will be totally different dynamics that needs to be discussed in the future. Since the conversation is still running at the moment, uh, and I don't have enough information where that conversation has reached yet, so I would not uh, deeply go into details of that, but I think still there is a big opportunity for engagement of the United States in this complicated region, and I think a very important region. Caspian is part of this region, but the issue overall is, I think, 
a, an important geography of the world at the moment, considering the fact that the great emerging powers are located in this region at the moment. With the Afghan peace process, uh, so uh, Afghans are very happy that the United States made uh, the primary uh, deal with the Taliban, the, what we call it the Doha Record, that has put the foundation for a smooth withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan militarily. Uh, but the expectation is high, not only from Afghans, but from the countries in the region, that this withdrawal should be responsible and should be coordinated and should be orderly, not in relationship with the NATO, but also uh, looking into more security dynamics with, with the countries in the region too. Uh, Ambassador Khalilzad was yesterday here, he's still in, in the town. With a, with a group of uh, delegation from the different departments uh, from the United States. They are, I think, trying their, their, their best to use the regional leverages, uh, leverages in order to make sure that the Taliban will engage into a meaningful conversation with the Afghan government. In the meantime, uh, they would be trying to, they might be trying to convince the regional big powers, China, Pakistan, Iran, and, and Russia, and of course Central Asia, in order to make sure that, uh, Afghan, that they would avoid any other uh, political vacuum in the future, which is important. Uh, at the very details level, as you know, that uh, the Afghanistan Republic negotiation team is in Doha. That's part of our portfolio at the moment. We are talking on uh, on and off with the Taliban, but the level of the violence is also so high. This high level of violence has uh, actually created a cloudy environment that we, that we could not engage into very deep conversation over some of the political issue, considering the fact that the people are suffering on the daily basis. But in the coming few months, I think, uh, the, the, the security dynamics will change and, and uh, we would see what, what would happen. About the opportunities, I think, uh, as you all know, that in the, Afghanistan is the missing part of the chain when it comes to the connection in the region. And I think the key question is whether the countries in the region, it's, it's not only a question for the United States, it's more for the region at the moment whether they would like to continue having this missing portion of the chain or they would like to integrate this missing uh, portion of the chain into the bigger, uh, bigger initiatives which are existed in, 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 the, in our region. Afghan government is in a good communication with the countries in the region, but the problem is that the dynamics of the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan is so strong when it comes to having this, this kind of independent conversation uh, with, with the countries in the region, specifically those countries who are competing with the United States in our region. The Afghan government policy at the moment is that this new phase has created an opportunity to redefine our relationship in the region and to exercise more our dependence and sovereignty and, and to, to make sure that we will be an active partner, an active contributor to any initiative which could bring peace and stability in Afghanistan. But the details are not easy, and, and it's not also easy after 20 years of uh, predominantly present military presence of the United States, we could easily convince the region that could engage directly into us. And as you might, as you have noticed very I think easily that the countries in the region also see Afghanistan as a weak point when it comes to their relation with the United States. And every, every country would like to take advantage of such an opportunity in their direct relation with the United States. So that's also another area. If I may conclude, I think in the coming few months are very important. We are very happy that there are still few opportunities ahead of us, despite a huge concern, security concerns, and the 
and the possibilities of the worst case scenario. Firstly, there's an international consensus for providing financial support for the security forces in Afghanistan and the diplomatic support from the political order in Afghanistan, from a democratic Afghanistan. And I think that's important and that message has been communicated properly. The second I think important point is that nobody, no, none of the countries in the region would like to see Afghanistan to be another failed state, which could be breathing ground for for the ter- for the regional terrorists. Because part of this fight is not only with the Taliban, 25 other uh, regional and international terrorist networks and groups are fighting in Afghanistan, including the Daesh, Al Qaeda, ATIM. Uh, Tariq, uh, Izb Islami, Uzbekistan, these many other we could name them. So there is also a consensus that we should, they should, I mean, there should be some sort of mobilization in order to keep the status quo to not pave the ground for these terrorist networks to, to exploit it in the future. And thirdly, I think this is also for Afghans an opportunity to redefine their relationship with the region and beyond with the U.S. as, as a big allies after 20 years, how we could we could take care of ourselves without having a big military presence of NATO and Afghanistan. With that, I'm sure if if there would be some sort of a political settlement in the future that would provide an enormous opportunity for, for the region, and Afghanistan could easily become a corridor, a crossroad, and a, and a hub for connectivity of the region. And I'm sorry that it my ideas were so scattered, I couldn't find a better way to, 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 to constrain them that could be interesting for you all. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, it was a great presentation, and I think we got really interesting information also on the perspectives. And uh, you also mentioned uh, logistics connectivity, like the Afghanistan is the like, crossroads for the Greater Caspian region. Uh, and I would like uh, our other speaker, Babar Badat, uh, former president of FIAT, to contribute on uh, that topic also, but generally to tell us about the transport logistics corridors of the Greater Caspian region, connectivity of the region with the big world, uh, but also uh, connectivity inside the region. What could be done? What, what are your ideas? You are the expert for many decades in the international logistics. What you could propose? Please uh, uh, unmute the microphone. We always forget that, don't we? Murat, thank you very much. It's very nice to see you all gentlemen again. Murat, it's so nice that you do this so often. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, it's very good. Ambassador Matthew, you are so eloquent. It's always good to hear you speak and um, uh, and try and pick up what you say. Excellencies, good afternoon to you also. Uh, well, uh, we've been, uh, Central Asia and Caspian region has been within the whole global framework of FIATA. Uh, whenever I've been there and even when I've been back home in, in Karachi, um, uh, it's been personally a very uh, area of much interest to me. Um, starting from Turkey and the Caspian region and Central Asia. And uh, I incidentally also chair the uh, the TIR commission uh, of uh, uh, over here in Pakistan. And for several years, we've been trying to put in place um, seamless connectivity between the region, between Central Asia, Caspian region, and to our ports over here. And it's been an enormous effort. It's, been, it's taken a long time, but we've been able to do it. About a month ago, the first truck uh, with goods from uh, Pakistan uh, left and reached Uzbekistan under the TIR guarantee system, the UN system. And this is about a month ago. And about 10 days ago, the first truck from Uzbekistan uh, came into Pakistan with goods from there. And it's a tremendous uh, uh, step forward. And uh, I think uh, you know, uh, it, it went through Afghanistan. Uh, it went off very safely. It went off very well. And frankly speaking, actually, I'm not competent, competent enough to speak on the political trends and strains in the region. So I'll refrain from commenting on that. But on the, on the business side, I'll certainly say that we are very excited to see what's happening today. 
Um, uh, the way things are shaping up now, there are hiccups and there are concerns which come in the middle. But the way things are shaping up in Afghanistan and uh, and connectivity in the region, and we are very, very keen that things should settle down over there and settle down within our region. This will allow seamless connectivity between um, our ports in the south uh, right up to uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, so we've got a vertical connect that we are trying to make from our ports over here into Afghanistan. And then it flourishes out open in, like an umbrella. So it can go into China. It can go further north uh, into, into, into Central Asia and Turkmenistan on the east uh, northeast and then uh, subsequently uh, move up over there. We have got many, many, many companies keenly waiting over here. We know that there are are, are a lot of companies uh, in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and, and these areas. Um, uh, also, I also got assurances from the president of Turkmenistan that he has um, uh, would like many companies in his country uh, to, to connect with us. And we've got a lot of Afghan companies. Uh, you know, Afghans are, even in the worst of situations, the best transport people are from Afghanistan. They're very, very resilient and very good. And I, I, I must say that. So what, what, I, what, what I was trying to do is to create, an, uh, um, create a settled environment where most private sector can work within a framework of, common, of commonality. So if we have... Uh, a global global best practices being adopted in different regions. Now, Pakistan already has it. Uh, I'm sure other countries have it. Some countries, Afghanistan, uh, may not have um, uh, it as 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 well established because of, uh, they're just rising out of the ashes of of this period. So we feel uh, similarly in Turkmenistan. I think they had a lot to do. But I spent last two years. I, I, I structured the national association, got them membership into FIATA, got them into a, a, a regime. And they're all now, uh, you know, assembling under a single standard operating procedure. So similarly, we would like to see the whole region connect under a common area. And then we would like that we as a region and as a service providers can connect amongst ourselves to create the assim simulation. A very important factor in this would be that, um, and I said this to my government also, and I said this to the Asian Development Bank also, and I also said it to the China Infrastructure Development Bank. And I would say it to, uh, to other organizations like the World Bank and all, that if you can invest um, uh, expertise, uh, consultancy services, perhaps funds to create joint ventures within these countries, it would be a huge step forward. So if we have Afghan companies who can make joint ventures with the people they like over here, it'll be great. If you can have um, uh, uh, Turkmen and Pakistani or Turkish and, 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 and companies uh, create joint ventures, that will um, sort of uh, give a leap to the connectivity that we can do uh, over here. So I think the governments must be pushing for this. In fact, I was on another, um, on another um, um, Zoom call with my government discussing this thing. And that was a, uh, a meeting which was supposed to be held to have been held earlier, but they delayed it and it's overlapped uh, this meeting. Uh, in this, exactly what I was telling them, and I was referring to your meeting, and I took your name, Murat, and I said, there's one gentleman who carries the flag of the region so well, and, you know, we should call him and uh, as, as, as a guest to the country, and, and, and uh, with the rest of that, you know, all of you, to, to, to come and speak over here. Uh, but, but this is what, these are the things we need to do. So the private sector has to be carried forward. So while we are making policies, uh, so one, we are making policies, Secondly, we are developing the infrastructure, which is hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. Soft infrastructure, infrastructure also means enabling policy environment, you know. So while we are doing these things, you need a proficient private sector to be able to jump the hedge and create those uh, partnerships, create those things. And you need the dollar on the ground. You need the dollar to, to, to create the development, um, uh, to be the architect of development in this region. So development funding in this area for these exercises exclusively for partnership, for long haul truck acquisitions, for these things. And, and, and you know, if you have three companies, three countries getting together, it should be different. Two countries, you know, it, it'll, it'll make a phenomenal difference. So um, from this platform, of course, I would uh, speak that this is an area that we should certainly be looking at um, from the Caspian, um, um, uh, east of the Caspian, um, Turkmenistan and um, Central Asian countries and uh, 
right up to up so we are we were uh, afghanistan most importantly afghanistan because it sits in the middle right in the middle of the of the table uh, so we should be all uh, doing this and we should also uh, have um, uh, you know more connectivity in the private sector and um, uh, i i hope we can do that in the next few months uh, we should be able to do that uh, as far as fiat is concerned we would be happy to connect with you to take this and and ask you ambassador matthew and and excellencies you to speak over there also so this is just my uh, to uh, small take on this please thank you mr badat uh, thank you for the exciting uh, speech and presentation i am also uh, amazed that uh, despite the existing situation which is not easy in afghanistan you already managed to move the trucks Uh, from Uzbekistan to Pakistan, and this is the first step. You told us just several months ago. We will discuss this later separately. But I think this is a big perspective for the for Afghanistan as a transit country, because uh, exactly. on the uh, map of the Greater Caspian region, uh, the only uh, place where you cannot uh, could not do up to now the proper transit was Afghanistan. All other countries were connected, and uh, and I think it's uh, going together with the peacemaking process. Uh, there is a progress on the peacemaking front, and uh, at the same time. Uh, logistics and business is coming, and this is very important, very important sign. And I think here also public-private partnership model uh, should work perfectly well, and uh, for these countries and for the whole region. And uh, thank you again. Uh, now I would like to introduce Dr. Claude Bigler. Uh, he is a Swiss politician, uh, uh, heavyweight Swiss politician, and. Uh, Uh, he was uh, the top manager, and as I told, he was the chairman of uh, Swiss Post, and everybody knows Swiss Post. Everybody knows him in Switzerland. Uh, before he was working heavily in logistics, also he was the vice president of TNT, then DHL. Uh, also, he uh, spent some time uh, managing business of Nestlé in various countries. At the beginning of his career, he was working for the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, and then in the International Red Cross. Uh, committee also in, in various countries and uh, uh, at the same time he the he the chairman of uh, Swiss China World Silk Road Association that's why he's also an expert in the Belt and Road Initiative or Silk Road uh, and I think this project is uh, still very important for the greater Caspian region and uh, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, Dr. Bigle to share his uh, uh, views uh, opinions uh, whether This, which which advantages and potential risks or disadvantages uh, this great super project, Belt and Road project, could bring to the Greater Caspian region. And second, uh, because he's a Swiss politician, uh, how Switzerland could play its role in the various peacemaking and uh, peacemaking processes in the region. Because it's not only Afghanistan. Uh, recently, we saw conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Recently, just a few weeks ago, we saw the conflict between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan for the water delimitation process and so on. And uh, uh, also, in one discussion, we, uh, he mentioned that uh, project of the Blue Diplomacy project in Switzerland, initiated in Switzerland. And I think uh, Swiss experience in bringing people together uh, and uh, do the confederation, do the even uh, the country with the four state languages at the same time, like uh, everybody knows, German, Italian, French, and Retro-Romash with only between seven to 40,000 people can talk on it. And uh, how Switzerland was able to assemble uh, the country and uh, how this experience could be useful for our region, not to assemble the countries, but just to, uh, to make the peace, to help uh, for development and so on. Also, everybody knows that Switzerland is the first in the world for research and development expenses, uh, budgets. It's also very important to bring new technologies To the region, we are not talking even about the financing and money. Is uh, Switzerland is still important in that field? Please, Dr. Bigle. Uh, microphone, please. <laughs> microphone. No. It's a small sign on the left side of the screen on the on, on the bottom. You feel me? Perfect, now it's okay. Okay, good. Hello. Hello, hello. We, we can hear you, yes. Okay, so if you can hear me and see me. Well, thank you so much, Virat, for all what you are doing for that region. 
I think that region, the Caspian and the Central Asia, is a land of huge opportunities. Uh, we all know that it has a lot of natural resources, not only oil and gas, and also other minerals. Uh, it also has culture, when I'm thinking of Samarkand. It's a crossroad. Now, to be able to really take full advantage of that potential, one should resolve one issue, which is the initial lack of stability and how to bring that stability. And the Benton Road has to be seen as the last avatar, as the last event out of a series of development of the region. I think that what characterizes the region is the so many external influences, the influence from Russia in the north, from China in the east, the Western companies because of the oil and gas, the Turkey because it's a Turkophone region, most of it, some are speaking Persian, and the Iran in the south. So all those influences is at the same time something which is extremely rich, but which makes it a bit difficult. I think a factor which is less discussed, but which is really an important point, is the tribal structure in many of those countries. And one tries to create a modern state out of a situation where even when you go to uh, Kazakhstan, which is so modern, so rich, etc., but you still have underneath in the local politics uh, the rivalries of the various tribes. And this is the case for many of the countries. So this is probably why there was always that big game in Afghanistan was typically the case between the Russia from the north and the Brits in the south at the time coming from the Indian Peninsula. I think that it's in that context that we have to see the Silk Road or the Belt and Road. The Belt and Road is a very interesting Chinese initiative which is supposed to be a logistics project which needs a lot of investment in terms of infrastructure to facilitate the logistics, but of course it's much more than a logistics project. It's a project of putting China again on the map of the world and when you see that sometimes it goes to Africa and a lot of places which are not necessarily the road, the Marco Polo road between China and Europe, it's a way to uh, make sure that China has an impact on many of those countries. And it's good and bad at the same time. Uh, it helps putting the infrastructure, it helps building ports, it helps building transportation lines. At the same time, it also means that China is getting involved in the local politics. It also means that some of the countries uh, accept to have high debts. And, you know, when you receive a loan, it's always very nice. When you have to pay it back, it's a different story. And um, so vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., which has been dominating the world for the last years and still has by far the highest military, uh, the Chinese are building their power play through the Belt and Road. They start by the economical, but of course the political influence is also coming in it. So in all those countries of the Caspian, I think it's good to take and at the same time, it's very important to remain a little bit prudent. I think what is really needed is that peace and stability. The key questions for me in the region is how to get connected without becoming dependent. So how to open up that without becoming dependent with so many people who have an interest to interfere in the local matters, 
how to handle the neighbors, not as competitors, but as partners, so that we can together grow and create wealth. And it means trust. How to move from the traditional structure to modern states, how to move from a post-Soviet culture, which was extremely top-down, how to move from some religious culture, and the influence of Islam, for example, is relatively strong, well, everybody knows Taliban, but it's in other places as well, uh, how to move from the tribal structure, how to move from the war laws structure to a modern state. It's not at all something which is obvious. And how to find the right balance between keeping the tradition so that the people have their landmarks and little by little create a rule of law uh, a constitution that which is not completely theoretical, but which corresponds to the reality of those countries. So, in that sense, I would say the country to which I belong has tried to help a little bit. The word help is wrong because everybody is sovereign, but to, 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 to give a hand with a few advisors. And I give two examples. The Blue Peace, which were mentioned. The Blue Peace is a way to study how to make the best usage of the water. And for those rivers uh, coming from the very high mountains to the east and flowing down to the Caspian through, for example, uh, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, well, initially in the Soviet plan, if you wanted to grow cotton, you would deviate the water more to the south. If you wanted to grow uh, wheat, you would then go to Kazakhstan, etc. But now, how do you do, now that they are not part of the Soviet Union, but they became independent states, how do you share the water? And how do you make sure that the countries which are higher up in the mountains, uh, the Tajikistan, the Kyrgyzstan, are not keeping the water for them through dams, but are sharing the water with the people below. I think it took about 25 years of negotiation until finally the countries have found a solution, which is a consensus. And I think that word of consensus is absolutely key. A country like Switzerland, as Murat said, with different languages, with different cultures, with people, very old-fashioned. Remember, we were the last country uh, in Europe giving the voting rights to women, but at the same time very advanced, so cities very advanced, countryside very old-fashioned. So how do you build a consensus? And this is probably what Switzerland does at best. It has, it has also a number of negatives because it takes time uh, and sometimes you need to have very fast decisions. Uh, COVID is a good example. But create a sense of dialogue and mutually built solution. And this is what Switzerland have tried to do and also in the bilateral economic uh, contribution, there's always an element of how to build the economy, but at the same time, how to build the local institutions so that the people can learn how to make their decisions by themselves in a, a rule of law kind of situation. I don't want to be longer, but for me, the takeaway of all of that is the region has a huge potential. We have to learn how to open up while at the same time keeping own identity 
and why to move from traditional structure to modern states, but which makes sense and which is not just a painful copy of what we have in the Western world, which would not be perceived by the population as belonging to them. And that trip, in order to go to modern institution, in a peaceful, in a stable way, is what will probably ensure that the region becomes richer and richer, and it is, in my view, really one of those in the world having the highest potential. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Begley. Thank you for sharing experience and uh, actually the history of Switzerland uh, and uh, try to explain and uh, uh, how this could be used in the Greater Caspian region. And uh, I would like to come back again uh, to the peace process in Afghanistan, although we're already run out of time, but uh, okay. Uh, because uh, this, pro this process is extremely important, not only for Afghanistan, but for the whole region. Because uh, there are at least five countries who have borders with Afghanistan, and all these countries, they're waiting when uh, uh, the situation will be resolved. That's why I would like uh, to wish uh, that this process will be successfully moving and will be finalized as soon as possible. And I would like uh, to wish good luck and uh, success for Mr. Njani on his position in this ministry. And uh, on that words, I would like to close the session. And uh, again, great thanks to Dr. Frank Richter uh, for organization of Horace's global meeting event. And we'll be happy to meet again and discuss the uh, issues, the problems and perspectives uh, and potential of the Greater Caspian region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you.